episode 99 of the Pilot the Pilot podcast takes off now. Hi, I'm Anthony Pence, owner of Foxtrot Aviation Services. We're an aircraft cleaning company and I fly a Mooney rocket for that company. AV Nation, what is going on? And welcome back to the Pilot the Pilot podcast. Thank you guys for tuning into the episode on Sunday. It was a special episode. It was definitely a special edition episode, one that I hope not to do many more of and hope that this can blow over pretty quick. But it was a state of the industry coronavirus edition. And I talk with Dr. Jim Higgins from University of North Dakota, and we just do exactly that. We talk about where we are in the industry now. If you haven't listened to that podcast yet, I highly, highly, highly recommend you stop this podcast right now. Go listen to the previous episode and then come back. It is a a very powerful episode and the feedback has just been great about that. Hoping to get him on again, maybe in a couple days and just revisit where we are today because this is such a 24 hour, day by day, hour by hour situation. Now, Aviation Nation, today's episode is a normal interview style episode. It is with an Ohio State classmate of mine. His name is Anthony Pence and he has started Foxtrot Aviation, which is actually very relevant today because right now they are doing some very great work. Right now they are currently cleaning all the airplanes or not all the airplanes, they're cleaning most of the airplanes out there, trying to get them ready for their flights and make sure that they're safe and coronavirus free. Anthony and I uh, were friends back in college, like I said, and I always knew that he was up to some great things. He was kind of like a mad scientist back in the day. So I'm excited for this episode. It's going to be a great episode. Now, I want to take it back to coronavirus and aviation. I don't want to keep harping on this, but I did just release a website called aviationcoronavirusnews.com. This is where you can get up-to-date information on what is going on with airlines. I have International Airlines, United States Airlines, and it's just facts. It's all the facts. There's no rumors there. So if you want to get the actual information of what is going on with the airline, go to aviationcoronavirusnews.com. You can hit our contact if you want to send some info to us as well. We'll verify and fact check it, and then we can make sure we add it to the website. Aviation Nation, stay safe out there. It's definitely disturbing and, and crazy times. So stay safe, wash your hands, and spread this podcast to everyone you know. Still want to get this out there because once this is over, aviation is going to be back in full swing. So go ahead and share this, like I said. If you like the podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. Check us out on pilotthepilothq.com, and you can also find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash pilot. Aviation Nation, I want to keep you any longer. This is a longer intro than normal. So without any further ado, here's the mad scientist of Foxtrot Aviation, Anthony Pence. Anthony, what is going on, man? Welcome to the Pilot the Pilot podcast. Hi, Justin. How are you doing today? Good, man. This is cool. This is this is fun for me because we actually went to college together. We went to Ohio State at the same time. And it's crazy that now here we are talking on the podcast. It's crazy. Go Buckeyes. I love it. It's great to be back. Uh, speaking with you again today. Uh, I'm so excited. Yeah, man. It's, it's a fun time. It's crazy. We were talking before. It's been eight years. We're officially old now since we graduated, since we've oh, seen God. each other. You popped up on my Instagram feed and I was like, yo, Anthony, what's he doing? <laughs> and still killing it just like you were in college. <laughs> one day at a time. <laughs> Absolutely, That's man. how we do it. Well, you have a, like a really, really cool story and one that I don't think I've really actually told before on uh, on the podcast. So I'm really excited to kind of dive deep into that and we'll get into that later in the podcast as well. But to start out the podcast, I usually just want to know about the why. Why did you get into aviation? What was the original inspiration for you? So that's a great question. And my why goes back honestly, before I was born to my father, he, he took an intro flight back in the mid eighties at the Kent state airport. And it kind of got him hooked. Uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon runs his own practice. So he's kind of got the, the entrepreneurship gene as well and, and passed it on to me. But he, he started with the one fifty twos at Kent state, like a lot of folks in our area. And, um, Proceeded on, got a 210 with a couple partners, and by the time I came along, was in a 414. So I, I really got, uh, I got a taste of it early. Uh, pretty quickly, he he moved up to a King Air, and uh, we took a lot of flights when I was younger, um, mostly uh, for vacation. He's used it for business as well. But I grew up in the right seat of the King Air, fighting for time with my brothers. Uh, trying to peer over the dash. And um, you can imagine that would be pretty inspiring. Uh, but 
that was really the spark and impetus that led me to say, this is something that I really, I can't live without. It, it injected me with the passion and the spark to pursue aviation. And, um, ever since then, you know, he continued to provide so many tools for me, um, as a young guy, he, uh, my dad went and got his CFI, um, he already had his ATP actually back in the day, it was easier to get the ATP, but he's always view it as, as an ongoing education, never taking it for granted. I know there's, there's the old doctor killer, uh, stereotype out there, but, but I view it as my dad as an inspiration in that he's always viewed it as another profession, not something that is uh, to be taken lightly or taken for granted. And, and I've always viewed aviation in the same light. Um, so, so really, uh, he gave me the tools, started my instruction, but before he, yeah, before he would sign me off though, he sent me to some other instructors to make sure he wasn't missing things. I was seeing other perspectives and then I really got a chance to be tested by, by other folks that, that had maybe a different set of knowledge and different set of experiences. Yeah. I was going to ask, you kind of touched on a little bit. I was like, is it true what they say? Are doctors really the worst pilots? But it sounds like your dad kind of looked at it differently than most doctors looked at it in the past, or maybe you look at it currently. So that's good. Well, it is. It's, it's seductive. If you do have a lot of money, I mean, it today, uh, you got the Cirruses that are, that have all the flashy electronics and the glass panel. And it's honestly, it's easier than ever to step into one of these things. Um, but uh, in, in medicine, uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, you don't just keep your license. You got to renew things every 10 years. A and my dad has always viewed it in a similar sense in that it's a constant, a constant state of renewal, a constant state of growth. And if you're not learning, um, you really shouldn't be in the left seat. Yeah. I mean, that's a great way to look at it. And that's kind of a hard thing to do too, because it's kind of like you have to humble yourself a little bit because you've been flying maybe for 10 years or so and you've always been able to do it, but you just got to constantly remind yourself that maybe if you haven't flown for six months, maybe you need to go up with a CFI. Maybe you should go uh, do a couple touch and goes, or maybe you should go shoot some approaches before you go down and shoot an ILS down to 200 feet. A hundred percent agree. A hundred percent agree. It's uh, even just to, in, in our world, in my world where I'm flying single pilot a lot of the time, you know, we don't have the benefit of having other folks critiquing how you do things, critiquing how you operate the aircraft. And, and even just that, even getting a second set of eyes on how, how you're performing the functions essential to performing the flight safely, uh, that's a huge component to, to maintaining safe ops uh, every day as well. Absolutely. So yeah, you have no one there to tell you, be like, Hey man, that was really dumb. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. Like, so that's funny. Um, so yeah, you, how much flight time did you have before you actually went in and started doing your own training? Cause you said you, you flew a little bit with your dad and you had some instructor time, but before like you really like solidly focused on maybe a private pilot license, did you have a, a couple like 10, 20 or did you have no hours going into it? Uh, yeah. So my dad, uh, when I was, I want to say 13 or 14 sold the half share in the King air and we were part of aero flyers up at Akron Fulton for a while. And at the time I got maybe 10 or 15 hours, uh, just casually left seat in their, uh, debonair, which was an awesome airplane by the way. Uh, um, but that really, that really convinced me to get my, uh, my act together and start focusing on it. And over the next year, I, I got all the book work done, uh, worked with my dad to get the 40 odd hours before he sent me away to, uh, some of the instructors at that club, uh, to take the final steps, uh, to prepare me and sign me off for the private. And right after that, I jumped into instrument, um, and a couple of years later, again, with the, uh, with the ongoing training mentality, uh, I got my commercial and, I, and I've got an interesting story behind that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> so did you come to Ohio state with most of your ratings then? I came to Ohio state. Let me think I would have been 18. So I came to Ohio state with definitely my private. And I think I was already working on my instrument. I, I'm 99% sure of that so I, I was definitely in the book work portion of the instrument by the time I got to Ohio state. That's crazy. I remember 
you were kind of a kid. I don't, you might be surprised to hear this, but you were the type of kid that I would kind of judge myself off of based on how I was doing in flying because I knew that you were always at the flight school. I knew that you were flying. I knew that you were you were well ahead of most people at that time. And I don't know if you knew that, but it was just like, I was like, all right, if he's doing this and I'm here, I need to do better here. I should be flying more. I need to do this. And I always thought that was kind of funny and I always kind of looked up to how hard like you, you were like flying and doing stuff. So I don't know if you knew that, but there you go. <laughs> uh, I, I'm flattered to tell you the truth. Honestly, so that was the time in my life, uh, right when I got to Ohio State, that's when I kind of changed my entire career direction because up until then, I was I was a confused young man and, and I was still on the medical route and I, I got to Ohio State. I looked around. I spent some time with folks at the flight school and I was like, you know what? I'm only doing this medicine game to buy an airplane. <laughs> it's not, Why don't I just not, not do this and just buy the airplane some other way? <laughs> so, yeah, so so why don't I, why don't I get into this as a, as a career? Uh, I'm probably going to be happier. Uh, and, and that's really when I dove into the whole aviation community. And, and that's kind of when I found the flight team. Uh, and I was that crazy kid with his spiky hair in the back of the class. <laughs> Absolutely. With, with wide eyes. Look like a I, mad scientist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why did you choose Ohio State? So obviously you had this aviation background. You could probably go do flying on your own somewhere else. You had, your dad had access to airplanes. What was the reason and why did you choose Ohio State, especially being from Kent? You know, Kent has a flight program or maybe other schools have a flight program or even nationally, you could have gone anywhere. Why did you choose Ohio State? Great question. So even back then, um, I knew I knew how unsure I was about what I wanted to do with my life. And in the state of Ohio, really, there's no other institution where I could get into my first year, pick a totally different direction, and probably still have a great program associated with it. Uh, because, because honestly, I didn't want to close myself off to any opportunity. And I mean, Ohio State's got the, the flight program, but they also have the Fisher College of Business, um, which is where I ended up also doing my master's. And so I think it was a wonderful choice, <clears throat> not just the flying side of it, but but from the university and education perspective. They just offer such a diverse array of educational opportunities. I don't think it's available anywhere else, definitely in Ohio. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I mean, Ohio State's a massive school with a massive backing, massive alumni association, and just like a massive name to it. So you say that you went to the business school at Ohio State, and it's immediately like, oh, cool, that's pretty good, man. He must be smart, you know? And the same thing with the flight school, even though at our time at the flight school, it is not what it is today. I mean, if anyone goes to the Ohio State Airport and they see the facilities they have now, just know that when Anthony and I went there, it was like a shack and it was like mobile homes and the planes were old and the plane just was not Seriously. in good condition or good shape whatsoever. One of the main reasons I, I quickly shifted to Fisher was I started the aviation management degree and man, back then it was not what it is today. It was rough. I, I mean, there are a lot of people, uh, Dr. Seth Young, he put a lot of time into it, but not only him, there's a whole lot of people at the center for aviation studies that have put in a lot of time and effort to make it what it is today. I mean, uh, when we were there, uh, I, I would not say it was the best, but, uh, but now, now it, Days, really, it's a. I would say it's a premier institution for flight training, and, and I'd invite anybody to, to check it out. Yeah, Seth and Martin, they did a really good job and turned that around, especially in the time that they were doing it because they were facing so much backlash. They tore down our aviation building. They wanted to get rid of the airport. They wanted to shut down the program. And they kind of had to rethink about how they're going to do it and how they're going to make it a premier program because they knew that Ohio State has a name, has the backing, has the money, has the ability to have one of the best aviation departments. They have corporate donations from from local companies that are giving them airplanes. You know, it's like they have access to things that most other flight schools don't. So if they could just make it a good program. People will come and will be successful. And they've done that. So kudos to them. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, Seth and Martin Rottler, great, great individuals. And uh, you're right, really bucked the trend at the time and, and leveraged the resources that OSU offers to turn it into what it should be and what it is today. And they made you into the pilot you are today and the businessman you are today. <laughs> yes. I remember yes. also flight school, you were always flying, but you also ran your own company in college. Talk a little bit about that. Okay. So, uh, the summer after my freshman year, 
I, uh, I took an unpaid internship at ultimate, uh, ultimate jet charters, ultimate air shuttle up in, uh, again, my area, Akron, Ohio. And obviously I needed some money as well. And, uh, I, I went to my mom and we were just troubleshooting. And I was like, Hey, what, what do you think I could do to, to earn some side money? That's not going to be completely scheduled and structured. Cause you know, I'm a free spirit. I got to get out <laughs> and do my thing. And she, and she goes, well, why don't you put out flyers to wash airplanes at the tea hanger? And so for $35 a pop, you could get your single engine airplane wash. Oh, trust me. I realized very quickly, uh, the, the error in my ways in terms of pricing. Got a zero to uh, that bad boy, man. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, totally. But, but I, uh, I got together with a good friend of mine, Chris Stump and, and back in the day, uh, I was a lot less, uh, I was a lot less outgoing. So he was kind of that side of the puzzle. Uh, the guy never went to class. It's a fact. And he still managed <laughs> to get B minuses. So I don't know who this guy is. So <laughs> he, he's a big time politic or great guy. Um, really smart in his own way. And, uh, we're, we're very much fire and ice, but, but to, together we started Foxtrot aviation and, uh, we started washing planes and yeah, in college, uh, I was trying to learn as much as I could about business and, and it was kind of an applied way of learning. Um, and especially in, in our neck of the woods, Akron, Canton being a smaller airport, there, there was no serious competition really let us learn, grow. We had a couple great, great folks that mentored us. Um, uh, Pat Humbert at at, uh, at a local flight department. He's a great guy. I I don't know if I can say it, but uh, I'll just I'll just say Patrick Humbert really has helped us out through the years. Um, but but we learned a lot about safety, a lot about how corporate flight departments work, um, and and the business slowly growed and and slowly slowly gained momentum. So that was a really exciting thing. Um, it, it was, you know, stressful at times still is, but it provided a really great compliment to my education at Ohio state. And it also, I would say kind of painted a picture of the limits of education for me and how important it is to get any type of extracurricular experience, whether it's an internship, a co-op, whatever it is. Um, you really need a compliment to whatever you're doing. If anybody out there is listening, is at a university and hasn't done something like an internship or co-op, I mean, it's so essential to both networking and expanding the limits of your growth. Yeah, you got to apply what you're learning so you can figure out how it works in the business world or how it works in the aviation world, you know? Totally. When did you realize, so you started this company and it was probably just for fun. You know, you're like, I'm gonna go watch airplanes. I'm gonna learn some experience. I'll make some money. I'll go buy some beer. I'll go buy some flight time with it. Like whatever it is. But when did you actually realize like, Hey, like people actually want to pay for this. I'm making a decent amount of money. I need to hire more people. This is like a real business. When did that kind of turn into it's when did Foxtrot Aviation kind of come in to be Foxtrot Aviation, what it is today? Well, I would say it was 2012, um, our senior year in college. And we, so we had a Christmas party every year and it was known to be a, a boisterous Christmas party. And, and I believe that year, that year was, uh, when the song blurred lines came out and, and we actually named the Christmas party after blurred lines. And, and Chris and I looked at each other and we, we were talking, we looked at the numbers and we were like, oh my God, we could actually turn this into something. It was, <clears throat> that was, I would say the biggest turning point w was just getting a sense of how we did that year, seeing that we were expanding to Cleveland, seeing that, uh, you know, there's this whole world of private aviation that, especially in the Midwest, um, it's not the East coast. It's not South Florida. It's not Texas It's not California. So there's not a ton of other folks doing what we're doing, but the need is still there. <clears throat> we're like, you know what, let's, let's pursue this and see how far we can take it. How far are you able to take it? Well, today, today we're in Detroit, Cleveland, Akron, Columbus. We have a guy still doing stuff in Cincinnati. Uh, we're out on Long Island at uh, ISP. Um, 
We are also in Nashville. Great city. Love Nashville. We are now in Las Vegas as well. And we are currently in the process. We sent our final application into the FAA to do our uh, 145 repair station. Um, we're getting into doing new carpets, reupholstery of seats. We have some phenomenal talent out there. A uh, couple gentlemen that can uh, sand, refinish uh, veneers. Uh, beautiful work, beautiful work. So um, there, there, <laughs> we've come a long way. Yeah, you since have, dude. That's scr- amazing, man. I didn't even the know bellies. That. Yeah, that's crazy. So when you were. 20 whatever years old, 21 years old, you have this epiphany in 2012 and you figured out this is a real company. What was like the limit for you? Like what was your, your goal then? Was it just to wash as many planes as possible? Or you're like, Hey man, we can turn this into a repair station. We can do vinyl. We can do like aviation. You can do everything. You can be a charter service. You can do anything. Was that your goal or was it kind of like a small goal to start out with? And it just kind of blossomed into what it is today. So, I'll take it even back from when we named the company. Um, there's a reason why we're called Foxtrot Aviation Services and detailing is not anywhere in our name. Because first of all, um, detailing in general, uh, I think, has a connotation of a guy in a rusty truck with a mop and a bucket. And, and honestly, that's what that's what a lot of our industry still is because if you look at it at face value, yes, there's a lot of money in a five or $600 wash of like, let's call it a, a, a G280 or, or a $750 wash of a challenger 300. But to do it right, there's a reason why that money's up there. You know, you've got, you've got scissor boom aerial lift uh, platform training you you've got fall safe protection training i mean we have an entire position de- dedicated to health safety and training uh, we have an administrative staff you know there's there's a lot of stuff which makes it sustainable and in the 21st century flight department uh, makes us compliant and makes us excellent. So the, there is a, there's money in the industry for sure, but there's a lot of folks running around that, that are jokers that are unsafe, that, that are just scraping the cream off the top and maybe they persist for three to five years and then they disappear into the night and onto whatever they do next. Uh, but, but we, we very purposely left detailing out of the name and, it's kind of the first evolution beyond detailing for us was we do contract line service um, and contract support for smaller flight departments where they'll send their text to school or they'll be on vacation or whatever. We will, we will kind of disappear into company uniforms and um, we'll, we'll have our NADA, NADA trained and certified personnel in there and provide the moving fueling and servicing needs for that company. So that was kind of our first branching out. We, we did always want to have a 145. We did always want to have some type of repair station because the biggest companies in the industry, uh, appearance group, um, the, the companies like that, they, they have the 145. F- the large, large customers, Textron, Duncan, Westar, you, you name it, they want to have that level of professionalism, accountability, and have the option for you know, small, small refurbishment. They, they don't have the time to focus on that. They're doing big completions, uh, super critical design, high dollar stuff that they want their subcontractors to take the burden and focus of the the smaller, but, but very important tasks off their hands. So that's always been a goal of ours. And we kind of stumbled into this opportunity out in Las Vegas and, and we're running with it. That's awesome. Do you have um, like buildings set up in these places or all these like mobile operators? Do they come to Ohio to be trained or do you go to them to train them? How does that work? Yeah. Great question. So um, yeah, we have leased offices wherever we go, but as far as new locations, we do, we send each of the crew chiefs that we end up hiring back to the, the Cleveland Akron area um, to, to get their, um, to get their teeth cut and, 
to, to work hard and, and get the on the job experience, which is so critical to, to success. I mean, even if you have auto detailing experience, it's really nothing like, like aviation detailing from the private side. I mean, j- just from a safety perspective, scissor lifts, uh, situational awareness and, and just the, the consequences of, uh, of both from a personnel and from an asset perspective, it's just tenfold, even even if you're detailing exotic vehicles, um, the safety component being the biggest thing, um, whether whether it's just cleaning on top of a wing um, or or working on a on a work platform, it's just a different world of of awareness and, and just it necessitates a different individual uh, that can have the awareness and can have the focus to run a team and accomplish things safety. And that's, that's, I'd say the other big differentiator between our industry and like an automotive detailing industry is that's usually a one, maybe two person ordeal to to accomplish a project. For us, you're running those one and two person teams. Sure. But you'll have a bigger project. Like right now, Uh, we're doing a project where we just completed doing paint polishing on two 737s. We're, we're getting started on an A340 right now, and we're doing paint work along with our detailing work. And we have 15 folks running that project. And that's just, it's just a different world from what, what other folks are doing and from what uh, anybody in the automotive side is doing. Dude, man, I remember, it's crazy to think that you went from tea hangers with a flyer for, for washing airplanes for $35 to now doing what you just said with 340s, 737s, or even bigger just goals and dreams and how you turn this into something that's like really killing it and like doing some really cool stuff in your multiple cities. I remember I was in, I was doing the rest of my training in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I just offered the flight owner to wash like one airplane for like an hour of flight time or whatever it was. And I got like, I was halfway through, I was like, this is the worst. Like you couldn't pay me enough money to wash airplanes. And the fact that you were able to like get over that for $35 to turn it into what you're doing now is just crazy. So, yeah. So along the way, we've had a lot of, a lot of help. And, and one of the, I'd say the most inspiring things that we've been a part of is our board of advisors. Um, we treat them kind of like a board of directors They're, they they have not invested in our company but they all utilize private aviation and all of them have also grown companies from anywhere between 50 to 70 to employees to most of them are four to five hundred employees now whether it's electrical contracting um, actually, one of the gentlemen, uh, he sold out his share, but he uh, was an owner in the seventh largest uh, apartment construction and management company in the United States. Um, just a just a great, varied, uh, diverse group of backgrounds, but also are, are um, in tune with aviation. We got a lot of TBMs. We got twin Cessnas, um, but the type of owner pilots where they can really see both sides of it. And they've kept Chris and I pointed to True North and kind of use their experience to to help us as we grow. Because I'll tell you what, no one is born with the the knowledge and the wisdom that it takes to to keep the train on the tracks um, on an ongoing basis and, and achieve the things we have. Yeah, so, I mean on a very, very much smaller level. Like I'm doing the podcast. It's, it's doing really well. I'm starting to to make a little bit of money, not really too much. Like it's a very, like I said, very small level compared to you, but even like juggling it with my flying and then coming home and that's all I do is the podcast stuff and like trying to turn it into a business and not be lazy about it and like keep your mind on track and just keep going. It's hard, man. You really need the support of other people. You really need resources. You really need to watch like YouTube, read books and just get info from other people. So that that's, I think that's really important what you just said about having a board of directors, having friends, having people that care about you. And I'm sure that's hard finding those people because everyone, almost everyone has an ulterior motive of what they want to do and they want to get something out of you. So it, it's a bit, it's hard finding those people too. Definitely. And um, in, in a weird way, 
the industry that we're in provides a, a ready conduit to folks that that are in that position that are uh, more in a in a giving back stage of their life. Um, so that that in a way was very fortunate for sure. And talking about where you are now and going back to we kind of you kind of mentioned a little bit of story. So how many employees do you have right now under the whole name, under the whole umbrella, whatever? How many employees would you say you have? We have 55 now. Okay. And then in college, you were <laughs> you were talking about how you were just not begging is the right word, but asking friends just to come in uh, drive for two hours where maybe you couldn't pay them or maybe you couldn't do that, but you offered them free food from Olive Garden. So it's really cool that you just went from from there to what you're doing now. And it's just really funny. Yeah, no, it's, it's been a long road and it is, it's, <laughs> it's really funny to look back on some of those stories and, and I would go so far to say is, is we did beg folks back in the day, <laughs> like, Hey man, I really need help. The, the, this citation is killing me. I can't do it alone. Now I can't pay you, but I know you want some breadsticks from Olive Garden. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So back at Ohio state, we, um, we used to go down to Cincinnati every two weeks to help clean uh, the ultimate air shuttle airplanes. And uh, we would pay folks hourly. We weren't that cheap, but we couldn't quite pay for the travel. So that was the perk. We would go to Ulta, we would go to Olive Garden and, and get the unlimited soup, salad, and breadsticks. Talk about a perk, man. College kid yes. was all about the ultimate, <laughs> the <laughs> unlimited the breadsticks. Sticks. That is yeah. the perk. <laughs> Can I get another basket to take home, please? All right, thank you. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I remember some of uh, mutual friends that we had were doing that, and they were wearing the Foxtrot. Was it orange Foxtrot Aviation shirts? Oh yeah, I believe yeah. I remember them wearing those. (laughs) I was like, "What are you guys doing?" And then they told me, "I was like, all right, good for you, man. I didn't have any time to do that kind of stuff, but it's like good for you guys. Like you're building a community, you're you're helping them out. Like that's fun." Yeah. How hard was it to to manage a company that you're building to go to school? You talked about you getting your master's and you're also in the flight department. How hard was it to juggle all of that and stay on top of everything, get good grades, progress through the flight training? Well, uh, it was small enough during undergrad where that that wasn't that wasn't terrible. I mean, it was juggling, but the the math was a was a challenge and th- that was some long days and that was exhausting and looking back I don't know if I could do that again um, driving back and forth between Columbus and Akron two to three times a week um, juggling school and work that was a challenge um, and that's where your support network comes in where your family is your backstop, where your close friends are your backstop. Uh, my, my business partner's great uncle, um, Tom Jackson, he's my neighbor and we call him the chief spiritual advisor because again, Chris and I being fire and ice, he was oftentimes the mediator when we had, uh, disagreements. Um, but he's got a garage and we would, like, we'd go down there and, and smoke cigars and, he would he would give us a lot of life advice and and really keep me grounded, keep my head on as straight as as reasonable. Um, and just having those folks to go to, those are the people in that tight core is what keeps you sane through the trying times. And I mean, even right now, we're going through a tremendous, tremendously difficult period. I mean, it takes a lot of cash to start up a big operation like what's going on in Las Vegas. And it, and it's very, very stressful to anybody that thinks entrepreneurship is, is simple or easy, man. It's not that great Cardone lifestyle or, or this other guy. They, they got these guys on Instagram that are, they, they portray it as, as glamorous and easy and, and quick. It, it's, it's really tough. It's a grind. And, and that's when you fall back on the people you love, the people you trust and the people that do have your back. Um, and and you just focus on that because as long as you keep your head and you keep working, it'll all pass, it'll get through, but it, it, you know, there, there's no free meal ticket to, to accomplishing great things. There really isn't. So it's not easy to go buy 10 Lamborghinis when you want to start your own business. Like they say on Instagram or YouTube. (laughs) You don't have Lamborghinis yet? What the heck? (laughs) Ferraris. Yeah, Ferraris. My bad. Yeah. (laughs) The Mooney is more fun and I can actually do 200 miles an hour legally in that. Yeah, you can. You're not getting pulled over for that one. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> now you mentioned earlier in the podcast, we'll talk a little bit about the Mooney in a little bit, but you mentioned earlier in the podcast that you have an interesting commercial story. What was that? Oh yeah. So, so my commercial certificate. So, um, <laughs> obviously I, I was moving along through my ratings and my dad, we had a, a Piper Dakota 277 Sierra Mike, a frequent presence on the Ohio state ramp, but it, it's, it's not an airplane that I could do my commercial. in. so, um, I looked to uh, the Akron Fulton airport and there's a flight school there. The name is escaping me, but I, I had a little trade with, with the owner of the flight school. I did end up polishing every single airplane in that fleet <laughs> in exchange in, in exchange for the flight time and instruction necessary for my commercial certificate. And it, it was an interesting summer. I'll tell you that. Um, and a lot of blood, sweat and tears. And, and to his credit, my business partner helped me out with that one big time. We worked together and, and we got a, a, a whole fleet of, of beat up uh, training airplanes polished up. <laughs> And, and somehow I, I, I straggled across the finish line with the commercial. So that <laughs> we did it. Yeah. Did it done. Never again. <laughs> That's crazy. At what point in college or in your life did you realize maybe you didn't want to be a professional pilot? Did you always know you just wanted to fly for fun or did you, was there a time where you wanted to be an airline pilot? So I'll just say to that, that that would probably be my second choice. If for whatever reason, you know, Foxtrot didn't work out or, or it got to a point where I didn't want to do that, I would absolutely go into professional flying. I think it is, it is a great group of people. Um, it's been one of the things where I've gotten to stand back and, and as I've kind of grown up a little bit, and we talked about how we were old earlier, um, I've seen a lot of people that just, you know, they're not happy. They're, they're not fulfilled in what they're doing. And then I see, I get together with the folks that are on the flight team and I, and I get together with, with my friends that are in the aviation community. And this is my pitch to anyone that's younger, that's getting into the aviation field. It's like, this is a group of people that's really enjoying what they're doing. They're, they're really fulfilled. And, you know, I'd say besides doctors, it is one of the most, it, it's, it's a position of such high responsibility, whether, whether you're flying, um, on the, the private side, carrying uh, executives or you're flying for the airlines, you have so many lives in your hands on an everyday basis. And you're that backstop there, You know, everybody talks about automation and how it's taken over yada, yada, yada. That's great. But in the end of the day, you're there is the backstop to make sure those lives are protected. And, and it's such a, it's an almost a, a sacred responsibility. It, it's, it's so important. And that in its own right, I think is fulfilling it. And it's a, it's a tremendous career path and I'd recommend it to anybody. Yeah. hundred percent agree. And it's funny before you started Foxtrot was becoming a professional pilot, your main goal. I really had no idea what I wanted to do at that time. <laughs> yeah. I, and, I, and I'll be completely t transparent about that. It, it was really a, a period of just exploring and, and trying different things and, and seeing which route I wanted to go. I'd say um, my interest in, in flying on a professional level kind of came later as I saw uh, just again, how, how everybody involved um, really loves what they're doing nobody's miserable. That's for sure. Yeah. They complain again, a lot, but they're not necessarily miserable. Exactly. I mean, everybody's going to complain. It's, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, you know, you even, we'll take that a step back, even, even from a cargo side, you know, completing the flight successfully, you're protecting yourself, your co-pilot and the folks on the ground. So, so it really is, it's, it's a very important role. It, it's, it's exciting. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you take off early in the morning and you see the sunrise and just look around at, at how, how, how small the, the, the world looks beneath you. And you just remind yourself, uh, what a, what a blessing it is to be alive. And every time I take off, 
it, it just provides a moment of reflection, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree too. Even on the bad days you take off, you're, you're, you're taking off in really bad conditions, but you're, and you're in the jet, you get on top of the weather and you're just like, wow, that's so cool. Like coming out of this nasty weather, coming out on top, you kind of like cloud surf for a little bit. Then you see the sun come up and you're just like, man, this is fun. Like I actually have a fun job, you know, it's like, it makes it worth it for all the crappy days when you have moments like that. Yeah. And, and just to be uh, in the right or left seat, you know, how bad can your life really be? You know, you're healthy enough to be flying. You got your medical, um, you know, whatever your history was to get where you've gotten. Um, you've had a lot of people that have helped you and, and, you know, you get to see the fruits of your labor. And so it, it lets me step back and say, you know, things are, things are not that bad. If there's problems, we'll work through it and just appreciate all the good things you do have. Absolutely. That's important. And that's hard too, especially when the times get tough to appreciate what you have, or maybe kind of know that, like appreciate where you are in your, in your career, whether it's flying, whether it's entrepreneurship, whatever it may be. So that's definitely tough. When yeah, um, we, we were talking about kind of uh, evil scientist or evil genius, mad scientist Pence back in the day, um, you were on the flight team and that was like a huge part of what you did at Ohio State. What, first of all, a lot of people might be listening to this. They don't even know what flight team is. What just so in your quick way, what would you, how would you explain flight team to someone listening that doesn't know what it is? Definitely. So how I describe flight team to everybody is it's a collegiate a competitive organization. And, and I describe it as track and field for aviation. And why is that? <laughs> it's because track and field, you know, there's lots of different events that all contribute points for, for an overall team effort. And so it's, it's a very dynamic way, uh, whether in the flying events or in the ground testing events to hone your skills, to network and to grow as a person. I think NIFA, the National Intercollegiate Flying Association, is is one of the best things going for folks that want to um, get a career in aviation and expand their network and expand their skills. Yeah, absolutely. I was always, again, I, I was doing football, so I, was, I couldn't dedicate that time. You guys, like, it's not just like some small time thing. Like, you are dedicating a lot of time to this. Wasn't it Saturdays, like pretty much all day Saturday listening or um, going in and doing aircraft recognition or pre-flight or practicing. So it was a huge time commitment. Yes. Uh, initially, uh, in the beginning of the season, it's Saturdays, then it goes to Saturday and Sunday. And yeah, you do sacrifice a lot of time. But, um, when I, when I started the flight team, I did, I now do not view myself as having a complete well-rounded set of skills. Some of those guys, Mike McConnell, Sean Maxwell, and then Scott Van Oyen, they really made me into the pilot that I am today. Um, whether that's being a lot more well-rounded from the knowledge perspective to really learning how to fly an airplane, uh, I, I consider flight team is one of the linchpins that made me a competent um, professional pilot because I do consider myself a professional pilot with even what I do uh, for our company. Um, but But not just from the skills perspective. I mean, you put yourself amongst a good group of people, right? So everyone around you is also sacrificing, is also very dedicated, and is also going to probably be successful. And they're going to provide your networks to the industry that's going to allow you to have that fulfilling career. And, and also, you know, if if there's a change in your life, say you you move or or you or, or you decide to whatever, um, you provide that next stage of your career path and provide those connections that'll allow that to happen. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's a huge networking. I mean, I've heard Scott's name thrown out multiple times. He's big at Southwest. And a lot of people are saying how he can help him get on with Southwest or how like just your network and what you can do to, to build that. And flight team is a good way to do that. And like you said, everyone has their own version of success in the aviation world, whether it's starting their own business with Foxtrot, whether it's the corporate world, whether it's maybe like a podcast or YouTube or anything. There's so many different ways someone could be successful and build together a list of names that you can then 
access because you were friends with them. You went through the same thing. You guys kind of have a bond. So there, everyone wants to help everyone. So you can't have that without building a network, without sacrificing time, without, what did you guys wake up? I think Saturday it was like 6 a.m. and you went all day at the airport. So that bond, and then that leads to you guys wanting to help each other have successful careers too. Definitely. A hundred percent. What did you, what did you focus on in flight team? What was kind of like your main event? So I, I try to dabble into everything, but, um, I would say my most fanatical event was aircraft recognition. Yes. That's what Um, it was. I remember we were in like some kind of, I think it was Martin's, uh, aviation communications class and they just show like a window and you're like, Oh, that's the, that's this, 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 and this. I'm like, how the heck does he know that? Yeah, no, the aircraft picture show, um, it's, it's kind of a wonky event that, uh, had its origins back in the, after world war II. uh, a lot of the folks, part of your military training is the ability to recognize enemy combatant aircraft and the silhouettes of them and, and whatnot to make sure that you're, you're training against the possibility of friendly fire and, um, you know, at least in the last 10 or 15 years as the, the internet has become ubiquitous and the amount of uploaded pictures has just, um, increased many, many fold. Um, it's become something where you can really get lost in it, have a lot of fun. Uh, and also you want to talk about networking. I can walk up to anybody with a unique airplane, tell them, Hey, uh, I really like your, whatever, tell me how you got interested in this airplane or, or what led you to fly this airplane. And believe me, you'll make an instant connection because 99% of the people these folks are talking to are, are just like, Oh, what is this? Or what is that airplane? Uh, or just like Mike Patey, he modified that PZL Wilga. Uh, the fact that you can know that right off the bat, that provides a quick conduit to an immediate connection with somebody. Um, and I, I think a lot of people don't think about that aspect of aircraft wreck, but it is, it's a tremendous networking tool. Um, <laughs> but besides that, uh, I did sim very intensively, which will improve your IFR flying more than you'd realize. Um, I, I did pre-flight, uh, worked closely with Scott on pre-flight, loved the event. Uh, I think it really trains your eyes to see issues that are wrong with the airplane. And it's such a fast paced, high pressure, more physical event that that's a really great, uh, a really great different event. And then I was involved in uh, nav and landings as well, quite extensively. So you did everything essentially. (laughs) <laughs> I really did, except for E6B. Yeah. I was involved in every event. Uh, I wouldn't want to do E6B, so I don't blame you there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my personality. I'm not going to knock it. It's just not my personality. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I think uh, Ben Gaddy. You remember Ben? I think Ben was big in the E6B, wasn't he? Ben is Ben is one of my best friends, and yes, he was he was deep into the E6B. Yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah, I remember him talking about how he's like working on his E6B. He's like, dude, what are you doing? Just use four flight. He's like, no, I can't. I got the E6B competition. I was like, all right, man, whatever. Get, get the whiz wheel. <laughs> yeah, good luck, dude. No one uses that anymore, <laughs> but good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you recommend? Highly recommend someone maybe in a 141 school that has a flight team to figure out a way to join and get in? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, I have a cousin that just started at Western Michigan. Um, and I'm pushing Christian very, very, uh, very, very aggressively towards their flight team. And, and I guess I think that's one of the biggest kind of intimidating factors to folks joining the flight team is how much time and how much commitment there is. Um, one of, uh, one of the things that Scott always said while, while we would practice on the weekends, it's like you have every other Saturday for the entire rest of your life to like have fun and party. This is the time to build your skills and to um, develop uh, your networks to move forward. And it's, and it's true. Once you get past the time that's involved and once you get past the initial leap of faith and effort, the rewards are, are just, uh, I can't put it into words. 
Yeah. I mean, talking to everyone I know on the flight team absolutely loved it. Like it was like their life. They all they, they, they were looking forward to that Saturday morning, maybe not looking forward to it, but they weren't dreading it. Like what I was thinking in my mind about how, man, this sounds terrible, you know? So it's, it's a huge amount of time. It, I remember you guys being kind of like a family. Like you guys were just like, you always had these inside jokes. You always had all these stories. You always had all this stuff. And it just seemed like a, kind of like a cool tight knit family that loved aviation. And like you said, it's a huge way to network. It's a huge way to, to kind of build your portfolio of people that might be able to help you out future in the future and help you out with your career. Definitely. And it provides the the mentorship as well that that especially if your family was not involved in aviation or you don't have that natural uh, folks to go to for advice that say, well, this is the step you take, take next, or this is the career move you do next to get ahead. You can have access to that mentorship. Um, because I realize that I am in the minority with, with, as far as folks that are in school and, and getting into the aviation community, some folks are really, um, proceeding to, to foreign ground and, and they don't have that natural pathway to, to reaching their career goals. And I think that especially for folks without the family connections, that flight team is, is, is your way that that's going to be a, a quick route to access to folks that will provide those tools for you. Yeah, you brought up a good point because as you see aviation, it's usually kind of like a family thing. You know, it's usually my dad, my grandpa, his grandpa, like everyone was in aviation. So they have kind of, without them knowing it, they have a list of people that will help them out, a list of people that will will offer recommendations. And there's a lot of people who are the first in the generation, who are the first one in the family to, to get involved with aviation. And that can be kind of intimidating when you see other people having, you know, a dad flying or a grandpa flying or a sister flying and already at the regionals. And they have kind of people to look up to, people to support them, people to help them out. But like you said, joining a club like Flight Team or joining other kind of organizations that you have at your school with aviation, that builds your network, that puts you in a family. And then you have that family connection because you guys are sacrificing together and then mentorship can happen. And then you meet people and then you kind of build your career that way. Yeah. I mean, my bomb, Jay Jones, uh, Rob Numbers, who was currently heavily involved. I just involved. flew with Jay Jones. Oh, yeah. No, I, <laughs> I saw that on your Instagram <laughs> yeah. story. I mean, just to, to meet all these people and, and to have them in my life in one way, shape or form, never could have done it without Flight Team. I mean, the plethora of experience just in the names that I quickly listed is mind boggling. Absolutely. It's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone's listening to this and they're interested in flight team, just go check it out, you know, just go try it out for Saturday, see what you do. And you might fall in love with it and you might realize it could be your next aviation family. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. And, and speaking to that, I would say to anybody joining the flight team, don't just go one Saturday, go three to four, because I'd say one of the downsides to it is it is a little bit clicky. It's very tight knit and it is, it's tough to get in on the inside jokes and it's tough to get in on that tight community and family. But man, once you're in, you're in. That's good. That's good (laughs) advice. Yeah. Don't just go to one. Don't listen to me. I'd go once be like, Nope, no one likes me. I'm out. See ya. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's, it's one of the big barriers I'd say to joining, uh, is that you go once and, and (laughs) you see all these folks that are like their own community and it's, it's almost like a tribe. (laughs) It's like, I break through the jungle and I see these group of people spinning E six B's and staring at airplane (laughs) pictures. (laughs) What a weird group of people. I want to be your friend. (laughs) (laughs) What is wrong with me? <laughs> so let's talk. I got. I don't want to waste too much more of your time, but I want to ask a couple of questions about how you use aviation, how you use flying with your company. So you just bought a Mooney, and you were doing some really cool things. But you take some great pictures on Instagram, really like doing some really cool things. But this is solely for your company, right? This is not necessarily a personal aircraft. This is mainly to an extension of your business. Oh, a hundred percent. So we bought the Mooney. Uh, a year and a half ago. Previous to that, we were uh, dry leasing my dad's Piper and flying it all around. Um, but we use it to go to all of our locations on very, very short notice. Um, to operate inside of the aviation industry, you have to operate on very short notice. A lot of my customers, potential clients, uh, they don't know when they're going to be available in the office because they don't know when their principals are flying. So 
if someone is available for a meeting, I have to be able to drop everything and boogie to New York or head down to Nashville um, or head up to Detroit, wherever it may be. I need to be ready at a moment's notice. Um, and that translates for us into between 350 and 400 hours a year of flying. Um, the Mooney is phenomenal. Uh, we have, we've got TKS, it's turbocharged. Um, and it's just been a tremendous airplane for us. It's, it's a tool that lets me extend myself to a level that I couldn't otherwise. I think that for small business, whether it's a professional consulting style business, whether, whether you're a lawyer uh, or you're expanding a, a manufacturing operation to, to multiple sites, I think light general aviation is one of the most underutilized tools on the planet. It could turn you in to two people effectively uh, with the amount of distance you can cover and, and the amount of sanity you can still have when you get there. And, and there is a lot of training that's involved in getting to where, where I am now. Uh, but once you're there, it's, it's incomparable. Um, secondarily to that, and maybe even primarily, maybe even the most important thing to what we use the airplane for it, is staying in touch with employees to have that direct connection with your folks uh, is paramount. It lets you ensure that the culture you started your company with is being maintained all across uh, the regions that we serve. We're kind of a unique profile and business model in that we don't have a ton of revenue, but it's scattered very, very far geographically. So to ensure that, to ensure that what our what our employees are doing on the ground across the states that we operate are is similar to how Chris and I spread the business. You got to be on the ground a lot. You got to be passing your knowledge on to them, and it, the only way to do that really is is through light general aviation. It lets you operate on your schedule. Um, it lets you operate on your customer schedule. And it keeps you sane when you get to the other side of, of, of the trip. Yeah, no, I'd agree. And I feel like light general, light general aviation gets kind of a bad rep because there's been a lot of accidents lately there. I mean, you feel like you're reading about a new accident almost every single day or every single week or whatever it is. So it kind of scares off people because when you get into light general aviation, like you have to understand the whole community, the whole world that you're getting into and how, how huge maintenance is and preventative maintenance and how, when to say no to a trip and when to be like, no, this is, we shouldn't do this. So this is outside my comfort zone or how to find a pilot. So I agree with you that light general aviation is very underutilized, but I think it's because of the history of light general aviation and the accidents that are happening. And it's just scaring people off. Yeah. And, and when you look at accident records, is, things have really improved in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, I think that the training has gotten better. I think that the awareness has gotten better. The AOPA Air Safety Institute, I encourage anybody to head there and just check out accident videos because one of the biggest things you can do is not necessarily be afraid of the accidents, but but take the lessons from those accidents and, and apply it to your next flight. Are, are you under a lot of pressure? Are you in a situation where you feel like you have to make this flight and it's maybe not in the most ideal of circumstances? Understand your limits, understand your equipment's limits, and, and don't push it. Just you, you got to be able to draw those red lines for yourself. Um, and one of the great things about the Mooney is you know, you can go to altitudes where you're above a lot of the weather, weather with the turbocharging, you have the ice protection to get you out of nasty situations. So it is an airplane that can, uh, get through a lot of difficult situations, but it's still, it is still a single engine piston airplane. You've got to realize that, uh, you got one power plant, you got one set of accessories driving the vacuum system, driving the electrical system, um, have, have your backups, have your redundancy on, uh, on the iPad, uh, on your, on your instruments to the best that you can. And yeah, like you said, preventative maintenance, don't defer stuff, get things done as they come up. 
Otherwise, it'll bite you either financially at a best case scenario or um, from an operation standpoint, it's going to put you in a nasty, nasty situation. And one where you might not want to say no to and you might take that risk. Because like you said, all that you said sounds <laughs> great, but I mean, I'm sure you can attest to this. It's easier said than done. You know, you get a call. Someone is like in Kansas City, like, hey, man, like we need you here. We want to we want to introduce you to this. It's going to be like a multi-million dollar contract. And then you're like oh crap, I should have done this like a week ago, but I need this money. So do I do this? Do I like you have to, it puts you, like you said, in a very, very difficult situation and one that maybe you might not be in the best mind space to make the best decision. Definitely. Definitely. And again, from that safety perspective, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to the equipment folks that maybe get into aviation later in life, they start off with an airline mindset when, and same thing with a jet you fly that you guys can get through and over pretty much anything with the right planning. If you start out with a 172 and move up from there, <laughs> you're entering a totally different world of capability. So it's, it's important to keep, it's an important to keep an awareness of that and, and it's also important to join the message boards online for whatever airplanes you're interested in. It's important to uh, sign up for local uh, organizations, w whether it's an EAA chapter or or whether it's it's a different organization um, in your community. Those folks will get you to the right people for maintenance. They'll get you to the right people for avionics. Um, and also you'll get your network of safety pilots. You'll get your network of, of people that you want to be around in order to maintain safe operations. Yeah, for sure. That's huge. And I feel like we've been talking about networking this whole time and how important it is to help. So like it's an underlying topic. It's just build a network that you trust. They will recommend you. They will always have your back. Well, not always, but most of the time they'll have your back. So a network is huge, like we said. All right, you have successfully traversed and finished necessarily the whole questions of the podcast, but I have one more section for you. It's called the rapid fire section. I'm just going to ask you some very quick questions and you have to say the fastest. I mean, the quickest, fastest answer, <laughs> no explanations, just go through it. Ooh, you ready? I like it. I'm ready. All right, man. What is your favorite all-time airplane? Cessna 421 Golden Eagle. What's your favorite, like a corporate jet? What's your favorite corporate jet? Ooh, that's a good one. Gulfstream 5. All right. What's your favorite? Uh, do you have a favorite airliner? Boeing 757. That's a good one. What's the ugliest airplane you've ever seen? PZL M15 Belfagor, but we love it. <laughs> All right. I'll have to look it up. I don't know if I know what that one is. What is something you wish you knew before you became a pilot? Something I wish I knew before I became a pilot. Uh... <laughs> This one's tough. You have to think a little bit about this one. I do have to think a little bit about this one. Um, we can come back to it if you want. Let's come back to All that right. one. What uh, here? What's your least favorite airport you've ever had to land at? Um, I would say Port Columbus because the the spacing is awful getting into Columbus. <laughs> Not going to say I agree or disagree, but you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, I do. <laughs> What's the hardest approach you've ever had? Uh, I, I, I shot an approach, uh, going into Akron Canton, um, this Christmas Eve actually, where, um, there is like 1600 RVR, 200 feet ceilings. And it, yeah, it was barely that. And <laughs> but I you did it safely and you made it. <laughs> well, no, I diverted earlier in the day oh, wow. uh, to, to Cleveland Hopkins. Um, I spent the afternoon with my girlfriend and, I decided to, to to go up again, got, got some more fuel and I did make it into Akron Canton later, but man, was it, there was, it was terrible. If no one has flown in Northeast Ohio or Ohio in general in the wintertime, they do not know what you're talking about, but it is, it can be pretty nasty out there. Some low clouds, cold weather, icing, snow, whatever it may be. It's Fog, interesting snow, place moderate learn. icing, you yeah. name it. We got it every winter. Uh, yeah. Every winter. Yeah. Flying in Ohio in the wintertime is not ideal. You should definitely go South. All right, let's move back on. I got another one. What is uh, Airbus or Boeing? Boeing. Favorite airline livery? Uh, Lufthansa. Would you rather have a bunch of short trips or one long trip? Short trips. Worst experience flying that you've ever had, maybe with someone else? Like, has anyone ever tried to kill you? No. Um, 
probably one of my, one of my worst, but my most formative, my dad and I were doing our instrument. Uh, we were, I was just building time under the hood and we are flying back from Memphis to Akron Canton. And it's a it's long, long leg stretch to the Dakota's range. We are getting back towards Akron Canton and it, it was a really weird weather pattern. These thunderstorms popped up around the Youngstown area and we're actually moving east to west towards the field. And at the same time, ceilings were dropping <laughs> and we looked at it and they were just the thunderstorms were getting inside the five mile range right around the uh, inner core of the Charlie. As we were approaching Akron Canyon, we were like, all right, we should probably divert worst case scenario, if we get struck by lightning in IFR and we lose our instruments, you know, we're, it's a crapshoot at that point. So we decided to divert and we tried to make it into Worcester Wayne County. Couldn't make it into Worcester Wayne County. Um, Cleveland was down to a hundred feet. Columbus was the one place that wasn't, uh, totally down to the ground. And, um, it was the one time in my life where I've totally drained a fuel tank dry. We lit, we waited until the fuel pressure started to drop before we switched tanks. But I always remember going mist at Worcester Wayne County. My hands were shaking and, and I just looked at my dad. I was like, what do we do now? And I was so nervous. I was like 19 years old and my dad looked at me totally calm and he just goes, the airplane's low on fuel. We have the situation we have, but we've got to fly the airplane and that's the best that we can do. And we got to stay calm and fly the airplane. And I have carried that lesson with me my entire life. We ended up diverting to Columbus. We landed. Um, we, we had about 20 minutes of fuel left on the airplane. Uh, it was not a fun experience, but I'll tell you what, I learned so much that night about airmanship, um, about decision making, uh, and and it stuck with me forever, and it always will until the day that I that I pass away. I will remember that night. You know when you you have those kind of flights, like those pucker moment flights, where you just pucker up and you're like kind of get scared, you get nervous, and like you said, you were able to learn something from it, which is amazing. But is there anything looking back in that flight where you go, maybe you guys would have done something different or you saw the weather deteriorating maybe farther out and maybe you would have stopped to get more fuel or do you, because would there have been anything that you could have done to prevent that experience from happening? Oh yeah. Should have landed in Columbus for sure. On the way to Akron, it, it was right along the flight path and looking back, absolutely. Uh, should have just bagged it and gone to Columbus. Yeah. It's interesting how there can be these just really small decisions that you can make that just can really keep you from that kind of experience. But you know, it's like nine times out of 10, you make that flight and nine times out of 10, you get in, nothing happens and you just get in right before the weather. But that one time you don't get in before the weather is when, when it all goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, it, it, you just got to look at each situation and now you say, look down the road, not just immediately in front of me. Well, what if I can't get into Akron? What, what if, uh, what if Cleveland gets socked in? You know, why don't I just land now and, and maybe go to Ohio state and get some Jack and Benny's <laughs> Jack. Oh my God. <laughs> Jack and Benny's. That's funny. <laughs> don't do so. that. No. <laughs> All right. We digress a little bit. Let's get back. What is uh, the hardest check ride you ever had? Hardest check ride I ever had was probably my commercial because we neglected during my training to go over accelerated stalls. Oh no. Let's do this. <laughs> what? What's that? <laughs> However, I would, I did know what they were. And so I was able to kind of pull that out of my, uh, out of my back pocket. But like when, when the examiner asked me that I turned white, I think. You're like, no, please don't uh, discontinue <laughs> the check ride. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's your favorite airline to fly on? Um, I don't frequent the airlines, but I've had a lot of good experiences on United. So I'll say United. All right. CRJ or ERJs? Which one do you like better? Oh, ERJ. <laughs> For training aircraft, Piper, Cessna, or Diamond? Never flown a Diamond, so I can't comment, but I love the 172 and I learned in with 40 boards. Love that airplane. So Cessna. Sounds good. Let's see. What else do I have? Would you rather fly over mountains, beach, city, or the flyover states? So 
they're all different for me. I'll say flyover states because of the sheer therapeutic effect of flying over miles and miles of nothing. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let's say you have to go fly to Las Vegas. You decide to take your money. You know, you got some extra time. You have to land at some small airport to get some food and get some uh, get some fuel. What kind of food do you look for when you stop at a, an FBO and you get the crew car? What's your go-to food? My go-to is whatever the locals tell me to. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, yeah, I avoid chains at all costs and I, and I'll talk to whoever's at the airport, but I mean, I love a good burger. Yeah. Can't go wrong with burger, barbecue burger, whatever it is. Like you said, listen to the locals. They usually know. That's it. All right. Who is someone in the aviation industry that you wish you would have met or you would like to meet? So they could be dead or they could be alive. Someone in the industry that I'd like to meet is probably Ken Rickey because I've worked for uh, as a contractor, a lot of his companies and just a really interesting story. I mean, talk about someone from both the flying side and the entrepreneurial side. That's, that's really done a lot. I'd love to meet Ken Rickey. All right. There you go. Fair enough. All right. I'm coming back to actually have one more. What's your favorite thing about aviation? But my favorite thing about aviation is how it's a totally unique experience that connects people in ways that nothing else can. Um, it, it's a means of conveyance that really shrinks the world and changes the nature of humanity. And it, 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 that is something that even to this day boggles my mind. Anytime I'm, I'm flying up at the flight levels at nighttime, looking down at the cities scattered across the civilization we've built to speak in really grand terms. Um, it just amazes me that I'm in this machine that is the, the, the cumulative result of the effort of engineers, of test pilots, of businessmen, uh, and I stand in awe of that. All of us are really standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, to, to be part of that is, is tremendous. But the second part of that is there's no other way, whether it's private jet, airliner, or even a piston popper like what we got to connect people the way aviation does. There's just no other way to do it, whether it's across mountains, oceans, great continents, um, when people get back together, whether it's for business, friendship, uh, and most importantly, family, um, that's a cool thing to be a part of. 100% agree. And I found two more questions I'd ask you. What is the biggest win of your career so far? The biggest win of the my career so far? Could be just like getting your private pilot license. Could be signing that deal with Fox Trot. Like, what would you say? My biggest win is always yet to yet to be, but what, but, but so far I would say my biggest win was the deal that we did out in New York because we have a new staffing model that has worked tremendously well out there. We're using that moving forward as we grow, as we replicate across the country, because our goal is to really scale big. And so I'll say that our biggest win has been Signing that deal in New York, taking the ideas that we had for staffing, you know, the, the lessons we learned from the board of advisors, implementing that, seeing the successes of it. And now we're really, um, we're really on the edge of executing that in a lot of different cities. So stay tuned. There's going to be some exciting things to come. I like it. What is your biggest regret in your career? The biggest regret in my career? Um... I think, and, and this is kind of one of my action items for the next six months, my biggest regret is not having a specific finance mentor. Um, we're, we're getting to the point now where I need it, and that's why I'm seeking it out actively. Um, but none of the folks on our advisory council have direct operating finance experience um, as like a CFO or whatever. Um, but that's something where I, because I've never worked in a corporate environment and because I've never done that, you know, I have my education, but I don't have much more to fall back on. And, and so I love my biggest regret is not seeking that out earlier. Good to know. That's good. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely something that's important and most people don't necessarily seek out until maybe it's the time where you needed him has already passed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 
That's funny. All right, I'm coming back to it. What's something you wish you knew before you became a pilot? Something I wish I knew before I became a pilot is that um, I wish I knew before I became a pilot how many people are out there that are just looking to get something from you as you, as you put earlier, I think. That's good. Uh, I mean, yeah, aviation as great as it is, it definitely has some, uh, some really bad marks to it. And there's some interesting people. We'll we'll just put it that way. You know, there's some, uh, yeah, there's some interesting people out there. So you gotta be careful. Yep, definitely. Cool. All right, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. It's, uh, it's cool to talk to you, man. It's cool that see where we both come in eight years since we graduated from the Ohio State University. Um, Absolutely, I'm, I'm really Justin. appreciative, man. I, I think that you're doing some great things. And it's so cool to see that you are still like just balling out with this company that you started in college. Just like kind of this little side hustle that you did. Now it's a full-fledged company and you're buying planes and you're doing just some really big things. So it's awesome, man. I love it. I love seeing entrepreneurship in aviation. And I think that a lot of people get a lot out of this conversation that we had. So I appreciate it, man. Well, great. No, and I appreciate you. And thank you so much for inviting me on. I had a great time. Good, man. I appreciate it. Well, have a good one. All right. And Aviation, Nation, that is a wrap of episode 99 of the Pilot the Pilot podcast. Next week is a special episode, episode number 100. That is insane that we reached 100 episodes and a special episode is with my dad. So I'm excited to have that episode out there. There's also the new website I talked about, aviationcoronavirusnews.com. You can find up-to-date information about all airlines. Now, I don't have all airlines filled out. I might have it filled out by tomorrow, but keep sending me your information about these airlines. I'll fact check it and make sure it works. There's a contact form on the website and you can also email aviationcoronaeffects at gmail.com. This way we can go ahead and get all those out there. Aviation, I hope you have a great day. I hope you're staying safe. Hope you're washing your hands. And as always, happy flying.